going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. On Tuesday, Roxanne Qualls took the oath of office for Cincinnati City Council after eight years of study and teaching about public policy, urban design, and the relationship of citizenship and governance. In eight years, she has changed and the city has changed. What does it mean for the future? Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Probably nothing could have changed the dynamics of this fall's race for council like the return of Roxanne Qualls. But beyond the campaign, her return brings the city's most successful politician in the 1990s back into a body that has been reshaped by reforms that change the roles of both council members and the mayor and their relationship. I am joined this morning by council member Roxanne Qualls. This time around she enters council as a member of the Charter Committee in a seat occupied until last week by Jim Tarbell. But before that, the seat was held by Bobby Stern, one of the great leaders of council in the last quarter of the 20th century and a close friend and mentor of Roxanne. Roxanne, welcome back. Good morning. As a member of council. Thank you. You know, when you left council in 1999, you were an experienced, mature politician at that point. Yes. You've now gone away for eight years. You've had a chance to do some systematic academic work. You've had a chance to teach, which teaches you all sorts of things you Absolutely. didn't know you knew. Um, how are you different than when you left in 99? Well, I hope that I'm different. I think I'm different in that, um, one, just the experience of, of having been uh, both on council and mayor in the 90s and then being a way to study and reflect. I think I've become just with uh, a little bit of age, perhaps a little more patient, a little more understanding of the complexities of change, and w as well as having a much, much greater appreciation that um, real change, particularly when it comes to government and governance, is not an individual effort. It really does take um, the entire body uh, of the council as well as the community to say yes we're going to follow a direction and, and that takes a lot of work and willingness to work to make that happen. Yeah we can all talk about the things we want. Absolutely. The great big it's changes and to. things. Uh -huh. But trying to put together the coalitions that make them really move forward. It's really a it's a lot of work and all you know because and I think what most people if they think about it in their own lives realize is that it's not just work intellectually, it is also work in the sense emotionally because you really have to be willing to um, forge an alliance with, a, a, with people in order to carry initiatives forward, but then also in order to have those initiatives result in systemic change means that you have to stay with it not just for days, not just for weeks, but actually for years. And probably that was the greatest lesson. Um, there's always the appearance of change and then there's real change. Talking about change, one of the places that reflects change is brick and mortar. Absolutely. And in our city, uh, the banks. Mm -hmm. It was here when you were in office, it's here now. Last week in an interview with the Business Courier, you reacted to some of the most recent announcements about the change, the potential change in the heights of buildings and the density and the use of how space on the banks might be used. And you referred to it, and I quote, reflects a desperation. What's your evaluation of where we stand with the banks? And I think I'd like to also say I hear a lot from people in the public about almost losing faith that it's ever going to happen. Anything's ever going to happen. So where are we from your perspective? Well, a couple things before I answer that question directly. One, if the development of Cincinnati Central Riverfront were an easy task, this would have been done 50 years ago when the first stadium was actually built. What people need to understand is that there is one huge challenge at the banks, and that is that it's in the floodplain, so anything that's built has to be raised up uh, out of the floodplain, and that is a monumentally expensive task. To the platform level. To the platform level. So, you know, so the financing is the big nut to crack, always. Plus also the scale of it. You know, this is not just simply redeveloping one city block. It's not simply doing a new port on the levee because people keep saying this. This is the equivalent of a space that would be downtown's Cincinnati's central business district. This is 16 blocks. So, so this is monumental. It's a hard task. It's a hard task for anybody. 
Um, but answering your question directly, when the voters did vote for the sales tax in 1996, what they voted for, um, and I actually remember it very well because I was at the forefront in terms of the campaign for it, was this was not about this was not about sports. This was about Cincinnati, and then. The citizens of the community expressed a vision of what it they wanted to see at that riverfront. They wanted to see a mix of residential, boutique entertainment. They wanted to see, um, you know, some office, but boutique office. Nothing that competed with the downtown, but everything that made it a place that people in this community wanted to go, you know, for to relax, to entertain, to enjoy the sports stadiums. This current proposal you know, doesn't deal with the realities, one, of where we are in the market right now, two, the developer uh, that they are putting forth has no experience at this scale, does not bring any financial contribution to the when table. When you say that, which, which part of that development team are the both there's parts? One, there's one, only one. Carter. Carter at this point. AIG took a walk. And AI, yeah, but they brought in... Uh, but you don't have the same, this is massive. And so what I think that, you know, if you're really looking at trying to get something out of the ground, we might want to actually uh, break it down into manageable pieces. You know, you don't build a, a downtown overnight. You take it one piece at a time and but, perhaps start with the residential. But Carter's talking about that, too. They're talking about beginning over between. But you don't give it to one developer. Okay. I mean, you don't. If, unless you want something that's really boring, really monolithic. You don't give it to one developer. You don't put all your eggs in one basket, to use a very trite and phrase. Is, that is the thing, though, that triggered this concern, this announcement of the increase, the request for an increase in the heights of the buildings, more use of office space, and therefore competing with downtown? Well, that's one of the things that triggered it, and it was something that was very predictable that would happen because um, once you put the infrastructure in, the easy thing to do is for some individual to put up an office tower potentially. Uh, it's much, much harder to build a really vibrant, mixed-use neighborhood, and that has been the vision of the banks. One of my concerns, those, those kinds of places have been developed in other cities. Absolutely. So it can be done. Absolutely. One of my worries, though, is that we take so much time to get things done here that we miss the curve. I mean, even take Great American Ballpark, mm -hmm. you know, which is at the tail end of the retro ballparks. And I think it says that architecturally. It, it, that, I would agree. That what we end up with is we stall so long that we miss the cycles. And is that where, we, are we in the danger of that with the banks? That this, this whole kind of development may pass us by? No, because a couple things. One, what we're seeing right now on a national level is a huge demographic shift of people coming back into cities. So the demand for residential will be there, and not just at the level it is now, but it'll increase. Two, we're in a market right now, which is not the time to try to be building things. Three, in order to build out 16 blocks, 16 city blocks, is going to take not one year, not two years, not five years, but it will take. Not one decade. Not yeah, yeah, it'll take over time. And so the question really is, is perhaps we need to get, we have an overall vision uh, that citizens support it. And what we need to do is now break that down into manageable pieces to uh, make the development happen. Another issue that you've always been identified with, and maybe one of the great marks of your uh, time in the mayor's office, was the vision and the execution of a new um, uh, Fort Washington Way. Yes. And, and that had transportation implications, it had design implications, it had all sorts of elements to it. Uh, but transportation has always been an interest of yours. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things on the region's plate right now. Yes. A new bridge, uh, widening I-75, a downtown streetcar, uh, and I'll throw in uh, light rail just because I believe in it. Uh, where are we on that, and what, what do you think we need to be dealing with? Well, where we are right now is that we are looking at a huge range of transportation projects and proposals. What we need to focus on are a couple of things. Number one is the rebuild of Interstate 75. It will be at billions of dollars worth invested in this community. It has the potential of reconnecting downtown to the west side, reconnecting the east side neighborhoods to the west side neighborhoods to basically lower the Iron Curtain, which was I-75 when it was built, that it created between the east and west sides. 
we have a potential. How does that? How does adding a couple of lanes on, e well, a lane the, on each side? The, how does it do that? That's the challenge: is that it doesn't have to be adding just a couple of lanes. There are new movements around the world and around this country that say we don't have to accept expressways looking like they do now into the future. We can actually talk about lowering them, depressing them, creating connections through reestablishing the street grid system. We can look at maximizing the developable parcels and making that more economically attractive for development. We can look at remediating environmental problems in the Mill Creek Valley, leveraging those federal funds to do that. But we have not started a coordinated effort to ensure that we maximize that investment. Because it seems to me that what we're on a path to do right now is, is, add, a, is, is add a lane on e every side, right. at each side, at billions of dollars. Right, with at, no actual improvement. So you're saying we need to step back from that. And say, let's come to the table and let's really do this as an integrated project and let's really make this something that really complements the city as other cities are doing right now. The other thing we have to deal with is that the city of Cincinnati, if it's going to compete in the future, needs to build its transit system. You know, everybody argues that the region re rejected light rail, and I'm not suggesting that the city build light rail. What I'm suggesting is that we need to look at building a transit system uh, that integrates bus, potentially a streetcar system, that makes it attractive, more attractive to live in the city, as well as less costly. Because Where do you start with that? Well, we potentially start with um, having a real serious conversation with SORTA about what's needed to upgrade the bus system, and then we look at what's going to come you know, forward back in terms in of the streetcar proposals. I've, I've only got a minute left, and you're going to be back on many times, assuming you but get elected. <laughs> assuming you get elected. Uh, but uh, that, that old uh, Metro Moves plan, yes. uh, 2002, there was a bus component of that. Does that vision, could, is that the vision? Is that the core that we could build on? There was a huge amount of uh, work that went into that. And yes, it was a very, very good core. And so we need to look at that. We need to look at what's coming forward with the streetcar, which if this is the first leg, not the, right. not the only thing, but just the first leg of an entire system, um, ha is potentially very attractive and makes the city much more attractive to people. Roxanne, welcome back to Council. Thank you. Welcome Thank back you. to Newsmakers, and um, we'll see where things turn November 6th or whatever it is. Stay tuned after the break. A major report about governance and administration of the Cincinnati Public Schools this week was delivered at a very critical moment. Welcome back. It would be hard to find anyone serious about the future of our region who would not put the health of the public schools in the center city at or near the top of their pri priority list. But Cincinnati Public Schools continued to lose enrollment, stumbled into the decision to put a 9.95 mil levy on the ballot, and now have to search for a new superintendent. Before we get into the fall campaign to fill three seats on the Board of Education, I want to take time for a report that was delivered last week that focuses on some major structural issues. On Wednesday, the outside consulting firm of McKinsey and Company delivered a 62-page report entitled Transforming Cincinnati Public Schools Central Administration. The report notes the system's steady academic progress in recent years that has made it the best performing urban district in the state. It credits the system with crafting an ambitious strategic plan and with enlisting the external support from corporations, foundations, and Strive, a year-old collaborative that coordinates business and not-for-profit organizational support. The focus of the report is on identifying steps to transform the operation of the central office to enable it to execute the five-year strategic plan. This includes recommendations about HR, budgeting, and performance management. But perhaps most importantly, it focuses on changing the relationship between the Board of Education and the Board's two employees, the superintendent and the treasurer. I am joined this morning by Jeff Edmondson the executive director of STRIVE, a year-old collaborative, uh, and it's an initiative that is concerned uh, with the entire educational pipeline of preschool through college, and it is headquartered at KnowledgeWorks. Uh, Jeff, welcome to Newsmakers. It's good to be here. Uh, this is a expansive report, lots of information here. Um, who paid for this report? How did this report get developed? Who, who initiated this? 
Well, it was uh, over a year ago when uh, the Gates Foundation, following up on their incredible investment in the high schools here in Cincinnati. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where they've transformed the large urban high schools into small schools. Um, essentially approached the district and said, what's the next step? And in the, at the time, uh, the district was in the process of developing the strategic plan. And that was well underway and wanted to get that done. Uh, but knowing that once the strategic plan was developed, that there was going to be a significant amount of work uh, in figuring out how best to structure the district to implement that plan, uh, they then approached uh, the Gates Foundation again and said, I think we're ready um, to take the first step. And the first step that they identified was to take a good, close look at the central office. Uh, and I think we should applaud uh, the administration and the board for taking the effort to have an independent, uh, objective analysis of the central office. McKinsey and Company, they're a well-known consulting mm -hmm. firm, not just in school circles, right? Mm -hmm. Who are they? They are a very well-known consulting firm internationally. Uh, they primarily have focused in the corporate sector, but over the past uh, five years or so, they've been working in the education arena as well, and they've worked with other large districts, Oakland uh, and others, uh, to do a very similar type work. And essentially, they take a very objective uh, and, and I think a very deep look at what's going on behind closed doors to figure out what could be improved uh, what could really help to lead to improve student outcomes as far as the central office goes. There's a tremendous amount in this report mm -hmm. and we can't cover it all in the mm -hmm. little time we have, but I want to focus on a couple of things. And as I said in the setup, one of the key areas is this relationship between the uh, Board of Education, seven members mm -hmm. elected, and the superintendent and the treasurer and just so people are clear the board has two employees that report directly mm -hmm. to them the superintendent and the treasurer the treasurer does not report through the superintendent and i think that confuses a lot of people but how would how does this report describe the way the board is operating right now and describe that relationship especially with the superintendent I mean, the basic findings, and this is the words of, uh, of McKinsey, and, and it should be noted that they, they took the time to interview community members, teachers, principals, the like, and, and so the review was based on observation and communication with a broad array of people um, that essentially said uh, there's, there's a lack of communication, effective communication between the superintendent and the board. Uh, and that the, the right step would be uh, in order to uh, ensure that the right information was being communicated would be to formalize the communications a bit more, to establish goals. Um, what is it that we want to accomplish as a district and how can we uh, systematically work together towards achieving those goals? If I'm reading the report correctly, it says that at the moment, uh, because of a lack of a flow of information, at least that's one of the reasons, mm -hmm. coming from uh, the bureaucracy coming from the superintendent and the employees at the central office, the board tends to end up not trusting that they've got all the information and therefore that causes them to take steps to, and this is their term, mm -hmm. the, the report's term, to micromanage or to, to begin to try to micromanage the system. Um, develop that a little bit. What does that mean? How does that impact the system? Well, it means that if you're within the system, and once again, I'm just reporting what McKinsey found, if you're in the system, you're often being, uh, re there's, there's requests for information uh, that you may not typically get from a board into the district, and then there's stress uh, from the district employees on what type of information they are to give the board. So it creates an environment of uh, tension, but this isn't uncommon. This happens in boards in the corporate world, uh, between administration and boards, and in other environments as well. Uh, and I think the focus needs to be, okay, now that we've figured this out, what is it that we can actually do about it? And, and the beauty of this report is they didn't just lay out a bunch of recommendations that they thought up in a room. Uh, they actually worked with the, the, the employees and the staff in the district to figure out what could be some very practical solutions. One of that was, one set of those was to try to increase the consistent flow of information mm -hmm. from the bureaucracy to the board, mm -hmm. right? Right and trying to make sure that that information was passed on regularly in plenty of time mm -hmm. in a consistent sort of way. A flip side of that was if that information was flowing properly that to, to one of the ways to cut back on the micromanaging was to cut the number of board meetings. One of the recommendations in here is we go to once a month board meetings. Yeah. 
seems, <laughs> it seems compared to what we've been living with, not much. Well, but I think what's, what's difficult here is carving out one of these recommendations from the others. Now, All let's right. just think about this a little bit. The, one of the board members I saw commented that the ramifications of implementing one set of recommendations would have far-reaching impacts. So if we've got the strategic plan right now, part of the reason that we need to, I think, as the, as the administration and board should be applauded for, look at the operations of the district, is we need to take that plan and then figure out what are our goals and when do we need the information in order to make the right decisions? And right now, when we have lots of meetings going on on a regular basis, part of that is because we're getting information and we're not quite sure you know, when that's going to be coming and how, how frequently we need to be taking a look at it. But if we really take the time to lay out the goals, which is, I think, the intention of the board and, and management at this point, to lay out the goals and then to figure out when do we need the right information to make the right kind of decisions about uh, budgeting, about where to put resources and when, about issues of that sort. I think we can make sure we get sort of a, a common uh, a drumbeat of information that's necessary. You know, that, the idea here is that the board becomes policy setting. Mm -hmm. It sets big policy, it looks at the big issues, uh, sets long-term agendas, looks at that sort of thing. But you know, for those of us who have watched the operations of the school system for a long time. If we just take, for example, the current facilities master planning process, you know, there is a segment that, and at every stage, you know, whether it's, you know, just getting a number of projected number of students 10 years out so that we know how many buildings to build, there has been strife and conflict almost on every one of these points. So how do you take a system that's been in that situation and move it towards this other situation? Well, and I think this is where we have a real opportunity if we want to look at it that way. Okay. We've got a strategic plan that's in place. As you mentioned, the report does note the academics of Cincinnati Public are at par or a, in, uh, better than any other urban district in the state. Uh, and we've got partners in the community that are willing to help. You've got GE that gave a $20 million grant. You've got Strive, which is looking to help and bring community resources. You've got the community wanting to rally around the district. And now you've got this report. You've got a roadmap. You've got something. Now, whether you take it wholesale or not, you've got something to start the conversation to get that going. The other two things you've got right now is we're going into campaign season and we're going to be electing three out of the seven mm -hmm. board members. There's only one incumbent who's even running, Rick Williams. So that's two new seats. Mm -hmm. So there's a chance to put some new people on the board. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, Rosa Blackwell has announced that she will retire at the end of her contract, effectively uh, a little less than a year from now. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go into a search for a new superintendent. So both of those things are going to be happening. Does that on what 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 are the problems what are the opportunities that are in that situation well i think we're fortunate that when you look at the academic performance of the district it's on the uptick so we've got we're not we're not having to turn around that which is the ultimate goal of all of our work so that's that's something to build on and then you've got new blood coming in at a time when you've got a new report You've got uh, the opportunity to, to really take another look at how the, the uh, governance relationships work out. You've got a treasurer who has come in and embraced the uh, recommendations around financial planning and transparency uh, that I think will really lead to some positive change that's on the mind of the public. Um, so I think it, it certainly creates complications. I'm not going to act like this isn't difficult. But I am going to say that, that you know, if, we really, if we didn't have this report, if we didn't have something to sink our teeth into and begin this very difficult work, we'd be in a much different place. Uh, we would be even in a greater place of uncertainty, where right now it feels like we've at least got something that we can say, here's a start to some of the critical issues that the community and their input, and then by looking and working with the district, uh, that, that are critical to student success. So let's use this so that when this new blood comes in, as you described it, they've got something to begin with to start the work on these very, very difficult issues. Uh, final question, because of, I know my situation with time. We also have looming out there this tax levy. From Strive's point of view, you know, you're the organization from the community that's trying to support the school system and the education. 
what is your view as an organization about this tax levy, given all of these other changes that are taking place? And we've got less than a minute left. Well, given the, given the fact that it was just recently announced, I haven't had a chance to talk with the leadership of Strive to establish a position. And I think that uh, our position is we want to help children. And when, when we see that this report is in place, when we see that there's a willingness on the part of the leadership of the district to take these difficult measures, we want to be supportive of doing that. And I think the levy will have to take care of itself. Okay. Thank you, Jeff, for being here this Thank morning. You. Thank you for your work. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, we plunge into the candidates. Have a good week. <laughs>